She's the biggest, most sophisticated ocean liner ever to set sail. Queen Mary II. We are upon the greatest ocean liner in the world. She's as long as four football fields, as tall as a 21-story office tower, three times the size of the Titanic. It's like your front row seats to like the best free show on Earth. She's about to make the first transatlantic crossing of the season. The ship cannot be late in any way. She was built tough enough to weather the roughest seas, but the North Atlantic is notoriously unpredictable. And she'll need all her size and strength. Queen Mary II is a billion dollar floating hotel, but this is like no other hotel on Earth. Dirk Brand is the ship's hotel manager. Good morning. How are you doing? Things are all nice and shiny. His hospitality spreads over 14 passenger decks, 1,300 staterooms, ranging from economy rooms with no view to luxury suites with private balconies, marble bathrooms, and a butler that go for $4,000 a night. Just waiting for the flowers to arrive okay. and the champagne. Fantastic. And then we are ready to go. Ready to go. His domain includes 10 restaurants, the world's largest floating ballroom, a disco, a casino, several bars, a spa, five swimming pools, the biggest library at sea, stocked with 8,000 books, a huge Broadway-style theater, and the world's only floating planetarium. The QM2 is so big, when she ties up in New York Harbor at dawn, it's as though the city has suddenly sprouted a whole new neighborhood. But she can't be idle for long. Launched in 2003, the QM2 is booked years in advance, and she must run on time. Any delays and her whole season could be thrown off. So the moment she ties up at the dock, the clock is ticking. At 5 p.m., she's scheduled to set sail for England. That means just 10 hours to disembark 2,600 passengers and all their gear, and get ready for 2,600 new ones. There are 1,300 beds to be made. Check out time. It's the reason you cross. 2,000 bathrooms to be cleaned. 280,000 square yards of carpets to be vacuumed. It's a very busy day. Very busy day. Hundreds of windows to be washed. And then there's the laundry. During a turnaround day, uh, we wash about uh, 3,200 towels, 1,700 hand towels, and uh, 3,000 uh, face clothes. Really busy day. Too much busy. <laughs> On the Brooklyn docks, a swarm of forklifts hustled to load thousands of pieces of luggage and 400 tons of supplies before the deadline. Put that one back inside now. Put it inside. We're we'll doing we'll do this one. Security is tight. Sniffer dogs scamper over the pallets. Find it. Find it. And in the middle of it all, Andreas Pitch, the food and beverage manager puts the produce to his own test. Overall, we get approximately 150 tons of food. So you name it, we get it. From caviar, vegetables, fruits, meat, poultry, milk. We load today approximately, I think, 65,000 eggs, fresh eggs. So everything. Feeding the passengers is nothing compared to the QM2's giant appetite. To cross the Atlantic, she'll eat up 1,850 tons of diesel oil 
and another thousand tons of fuel for the gas turbines. It takes six hours to fill the huge storage tanks in the belly of the ship. Above them is the engine room. It's hot, noisy, and usually humming. This is the only time engineers like Brent and Clifford get a chance to catch up on repairs. Turnaround day is definitely one of our busiest days because um, throughout the, the crossings, we, uh, things come to light that uh, need to be attended to, and also we have our uh, routine maintenance that we must attend to. The QM2 is powered by four gigantic diesel generators and two gas turbines. To date, the diesels have been running for more than 24,000 hours, and they're due for a checkup. The engineers have only a few hours to strip down the turbocharger on one of the engines, make a few repairs, and put it back together before they cast off. Now, it's very important that it's done in a timely manner, because we must be ready for when we sail. The ship cannot be late in any way. It's now just three hours before the QM2 is scheduled to set sail, and every minute counts. Inside the Brooklyn Terminal, 30 computer check-in units are linked to the ship's database through fiber optics. Wow. Thank you. Every passenger gets a photo ID that doubles as a room key and charge card. They'll use it everywhere, from the gift shop to the casino, since they don't accept cash on board. Boarding are 2,600 passengers from all over the world. And they're not here for a cruise ship holiday. These are real ship buffs looking for a bit of adventure. They'll spend the next six nights and five days on board Queen Mary 2, and they're expecting the experience of a lifetime. Where's the champagne? While it's all smiles and soft music along the greeting line, down below in the baggage hold, it's controlled chaos. There are 4,500 pieces of luggage to be sorted, and Officer Andrea Kaiser has enlisted every free bartender, cook, waiter, and housekeeper. The luggage is accumulating outside, and it just comes on so fast, so I need to push them. Otherwise, it just, it's just a backlog of everything. This is every six days on transatlantic season. With the hour of departure fast approaching, up on the bridge, the senior officers have their own challenges. So this is the remains of the low pressure that's been sitting here now off the seaboard. This is the nerve center of the QM2. And officers James Griffiths and Nigel Smythe have been tracking a storm a few hundred miles off the coast. It looks like they'll have to sail right into it. And this week up we have seas on the bow, sort of 12, 15 feet. Okay, perhaps. okay, that looks good. Yeah. They must factor in prevailing winds and sea currents, fuel efficiency, even the curvature of the earth in plotting the best route to Southampton. They'll try to skirt the worst of the storm by steering farther north, but there's a limit to how far they can detour. You may be trying to stay within the best weather that you can stay within for the ship without adding on unrealistic distance. So there comes a point in time, obviously, where you have to consider the fact that you have to get to Southampton on time. Hello, welcome on board, guys. This way, please. One hour before departure, the QM2 puts her passengers through a mustard drill to make sure they know what to do and where to go in case of emergency. In the middle of the drill, a strange twist. 
medical emergency line name and location, please. There's a real yeah. emergency. Yes, ma'am, what seems to be the problem? Difficulty breathing. The ship's medical unit is dispatched to one of the staterooms. One of the passengers has had a heart attack. The passenger is evacuated from the ship and turned over to a medical team on the ground. By the time the ship's captain, Commodore Bernard Warner, finally gives the orders to cast off, the QM2 is two and a half hours behind schedule. And that means he'll have to step on the gas once they're at sea. That's all lines in board for an officer. Okay. By now, the light is fading, and because the tides are rising, sailing under the Verrazano Narrows Bridge is going to be a very tight squeeze. And beyond that, there's a storm brewing that Queen Mary II will have to meet head on. Queen Mary II is late leaving New York Harbor. She's losing light, and the tide is rising fast. So clearing the Verrazano Narrows Bridge is going to be a challenge. But she has the advantage of the most sophisticated marine technology in the world. Bow to starboard, and port three thrust into starboard. The ship is propelled by four separate pods suspended from the hull each with its own electric motor and propeller. They weigh 320 tons apiece, as much as a fully loaded jumbo jet. Ship's starting to lift off bodily. Now fore and aft movement. The two forward pods are fixed, but the two at the stern, called azipods, are able to swivel 360 degrees. This allows the ship to steer without a rudder and maneuver without the help of tugboats. Together, the pods deliver a whopping 157,000 horsepower. The bow is starting to lead. We have two feet aft. Control James. Hi. Okay. Thanks, sir. They're uh, taking thrusters now. To help turn the ship, the QM2 also uses three bow thrusters, huge propellers concealed behind massive steel doors in the hull. They can churn out 13,000 horsepower, enough sideways thrust to spin the ship around in its own length. Everything is run from the bridge with a single controller not much bigger than the joystick for a video game. As the big ship glides out of harbor, a pilot guide with an expert knowledge of the local waters helps the Commodore negotiate the channel. We've got the uh, Verrazano Bridge, of course, and the air draft of the ship tonight is 62 meters. Okay, well, we will aim for the middle of the bridge. Yeah. Middle of the bridge, shall we have? If the QM2 had left on time, her towering funnel would have cleared the Verrazano Bridge easily. But now, the tide is higher, and it's going to be tight. She must pass under the bridge dead center. Your pilot speed is five knots, now you're making good. Two, four, four, over the ground. So you're currently carrying six degrees set to starboard, easing off slowly. If they miss the mark, it could cause serious damage to both the ship and the bridge. What do you want to come up to? We'll do about 15. 15, okay. Let's come up to 15 knots, please. 
The QM2 plows ahead at 50 knots, and she's not slowing down. Queen Mary 2 approaching the Narrows Bridge outbound. This is the moment of truth. She squeezes under the steel girders with just a few meters to spare. Now, there's nothing ahead but open sea. Commodore is the code. Commodore is the code. Queen Mary 2 cruises at nearly 27 knots. That's more than 50 kilometers an hour. The Commodore brings her up to speed and leaves the bridge to the officers on watch. Commodore Warner is responsible for everything and everybody on the ship. And as commander of the world's largest ocean liner, He's expected to be as much an ambassador as a mariner. I have to say the ladies look particularly glamorous this evening. Thank you. Thank you very much. In many ways, I suppose you could look upon my job as being uh, mayor of the city. But for all its grandeur and opulence, his city is still just a ship, a tiny cork on a vast ocean. And the passengers are about to get a sharp reminder that the North Atlantic can whip up seas as rough as any place on Earth. Come morning, the weather has taken a turn for the worse. The ship is crashing through six-meter waves. Sometimes there are winds out here of 120 kilometers an hour and waves the size of a house. We are upon the greatest ocean liner in the world, and there is no other ship that will ride weather better than this one. But um, the Atlantic generally doesn't look terribly spring-like at the moment. But Queen Mary II is not a cruise ship. She's an ocean liner with a sharp bow and a deep hull. She was built to be driven hard through the worst the sea can throw at her. Stephen Payne, the man who designed the QM2, knew there'd be days she'd take a beating. Good afternoon. So he perched her lifeboats high above the waterline, where even a rogue wave can't hurt them. And he shaped the bridge to protect her passenger decks. These balconies are so high up that they're certainly not vulnerable and they're protected forward by the superstructure front. The balconies within the hull, instead of having the glass, they have a solid bulwark, so that protects them. So there's certainly no uh, vulnerability from having the balconies. The ship was designed to ensure the safety and comfort of her passengers and crew. But the rough weather has put tonight's stage performance in jeopardy. Yeah. What do you think? What do you think? It's not as good, is it? No, not really. I mean, this is worse than last week. Okay. The show tonight particularly is a challenge because it's a show where we use the orchestra pit, which means if the dancers are right near the edge of the stage, there's a 10-foot drop immediately in front of them. The bridge calls down to the engine room to try something to stabilize the ship and save the show. Hello, James. It's James. Uh, listen, we're going to come around a few degrees for this weather, so we're going to try and uh, put these stabilizers out for a few minutes, if that's okay with you. Start with more stabilizer. Okay. Thanks. In rough seas, the QM2 can deploy four folding fin stabilizers. They're like outriggers that extend from the sides of the hull to keep the ship from rolling from side to side. OK. It's all four stabilizers deployed now, James. OK. OK. You got a man on the wheel, steering 074. 074. The bigger problem is the ship is pitching up and down, not just rolling from side to side, and the stabilizers can't help with that. Doesn't seem to be 
seem to be having a great deal of effect, is it? No, I think the pitch in motion is really staying the same. It's yeah. just not coming across these wells any better. And a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Alastair Cruz, director again. Unfortunately, the motion of the ship does affect the performance of our shows featuring our singers and dancers. As a result, we have taken the decision to postpone this evening's performance of Rock at the Opera, and we will endeavour to present that to you later on in the voyage. But most of the entertainment on board is weatherproof. Some passengers thrive on big seas, but for others, motion sickness can make ship life miserable. Hello, medical center. And there's always the possibility that seasickness may be masking a much more serious problem, one that could threaten the health of everyone on board. On a ship this size, most passengers don't feel the waves. But some do. And sailors say when you're seasick, at first you worry you might die. But after a while, you worry that you won't. Hello, medical center. When you say ill, um, how, how do you mean specifically? What's, what's troubling you? You're sort of feeling nauseous. Have you actually been sick? You have. Okay. Um, how about the other end of the system? But the medical center is getting calls from passengers with even more serious symptoms. Any any diarrhea? By the fourth okay. call, they're getting right. worried. Um, are you... An infectious virus can flash through the ship's population, passengers and crew, in 48 hours. So when the medical unit discovers they've got a case of norovirus on board, They've got to move fast. They quarantine sick passengers for 24 hours even after their symptoms disappear. The norovirus type viruses that cause the gastrointestinal upset are very contagious, can be spread by um, coughing, sneezing. Um, if somebody vomits, there can be particles come off, so they're very contagious. It's possible that a lot of people um, would be affected. There are rigorous procedures in place to contain the virus and prevent an outbreak. All right, just make sure you touch all the surfaces. And make sure that you start from the back of the cabin, spray the door handle of the balcony door. Make sure you spray all the handles and the cupboards and drawers. A hit squad of cleaners is dispatched to disinfect state rooms and every public space where someone has been sick. Don't forget the carpet, little bit of splash, we always need there. We have to follow the public health guidance on this. We don't really have any choice. People you know, are generally are very cooperative. Every uh, square inch of this ship has to be sanitized because you never know where is the virus. Virus might be here, might be here. You never know where is it. Whatever we can do, we'll do it. Bedding and towels are packed into special bags that dissolve in water. They're run through high temperature washing machines that heat the water to near boiling. Norovirus can sink a ship's reputation. But the QM2's systematic efforts pay off. The virus is contained to a small group of people who had contact with the original carrier who brought it on board. The next morning, the weather turns, and the ship is no longer bucking 15-foot swells. Morning, sir. Morning, sir. Oh, much better day today, I think. Perhaps, indeed. In actual fact, she's just about up to the speed required, isn't she? She's doing yeah, 26 and a half most of the time now. I've made up that uh, two hours we lost in New York. Yeah. With the calmer seas, Queen Mary II is picking up speed and the captain could afford to throttle back a little. With better weather comes better appetites. In the main galley, 
things are heating up. Hello, monsieur. Can you keep your food hot or are you going right away? Can you keep it there? Please, come on. The top seller this evening will be our Gravelax, okay? We have a Gravelax, which is homemade with a celery rack and a dill uh, sour cream, okay? We're probably selling on the first sitting about 200 of them. Jean-Marie Zimmerman is executive chef and boss to 150 chefs de cuisine in nine separate galleys. And he's once again orchestrating 16,000 meals a day. There is nobody here, Joy. Joy, okay, then don't pour the soup. Do the soups when they're actually here, yeah? Okay. As head of all things edible aboard Queen Mary II, Jean-Marie's reputation is always at stake. And he's not happy about one dish that came out of his kitchen last night. The next thing I want to say last night was the risotto. It was slop, so far as I was concerned, okay? Every night, I'm not being funny, but it's me who, who on the last minute, who have to rectify things. And that's not on, okay? That's true. But I think the most important is that I'm all, all the time connecting with my chef de cuisines and my middle management. I keep the reins very tight, as you can see, okay? But I, you know, in the morning I'm very tough, during the day I'm very tough, but we also have days where we have a good drink together and we have a lot. So they exactly know what I'm like, okay? In the Britannia dining room, there are two sittings a night, each with 1,300 diners. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Lovely to see you all. Thank you for joining us. Nice to see you again. And tonight, it's a black tie affair, so the chef is under the gun. Hey, can you take two hands, my friend, when you pick up? Yes. It's slowly starting now. The pressure is increasing slowly. It's very organized, everything's controlled. There is no panic. Every waiter is behind each other, and they're picking up their courses as they go along. And then once they finish, they go. Dishing out 16,000 meals day after day is a monumental feat of organization. I'm gonna have the, uh, ooh, the broccoli soup. But on this ship, the chef has high-tech help. A computer program keeps track of what's ordered and what they're running are. out of. This is basically what's been ordered, as you can see. We already had uh, sea bass already, 235. Venison, medium, we had 86. Down the hall, the provisions department is plugged into the same system. That way, the food and beverage manager knows exactly, right down to the last crumb, what he's got in stock. I know exactly how many potatoes we use, how many carrots. I see how much each gully is requesting, how much we have remaining on board. When the bartender enters his drink order in the register machine, and for example, he orders a dirty martini, crunch them will deplete automatically the, the, the chin and also the vermouth and the olive. I think we run out of fuel before we run out of food. The galleys on the QM2 never sleep. They go 24 hours a day, every day at sea. And once every voyage, the chefs get their moment in the sun. We're extremely privileged and proud to have him as our executive chef on board Queen Mary 2, all the way from Strasbourg in France, Jean-Marie Zimmermann. They're introduced to the passengers like a conductor and his orchestra after a performance. After three days at sea, Queen Mary II is approaching the midpoint of her voyage, the point of no return. It means it's just as far to keep going as it is to turn back. She's about 3,000 kilometers from land, and if something goes wrong, she's on her own. It's day three, the midpoint of the transatlantic crossing, 
and Queen Mary II is literally in the middle of nowhere, almost 3,000 kilometers from the nearest land. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is the Commodore. In precisely 18 minutes' time, we'll be exactly halfway through the voyage. But the ship is right in her element. She's a floating, self-sufficient city. There's enough food on board to feed an army and the biggest wine cellar afloat with 40,000 bottles. They range between, let's say, between $25 up to $4,000 for one bottle of wine. An 11-bed hospital with an x-ray machine and a well-equipped lab. A self-contained computer network with access to email in every room. From my experience, it's probably the most technologically advanced ship I've ever been on. Two satellite antennas providing communication from anywhere at sea to anywhere in the world. And a power plant that generates 118 million watts of power, enough electricity to light up a city of 200,000. But the key element for survival is water. The QM2 is surrounded by it, only it's fresh water she needs. Water for drinking, water for its 2,000 bathrooms, water for the galleys, and a whole lot of water for washing. We use on a daily basis, uh, I would say approximately 80,000 pieces of china. So we have 85 people in charge only to wash dishes and they work 24 hours. It's a day and a night shift. Queen Mary II uses more than a thousand tons of fresh water every day. That's about one million liters. Even the QM2 isn't big enough to store that much water, so she makes it herself. Seawater is drawn into the ship through three ducts in the bottom of the hull. It's pumped into three low-pressure flash evaporators where it's boiled by waste heat from the engines. The steam condenses into distilled water that's pumped into storage tanks. The salt collects on the filters in huge wafers. The QM2 can make almost two million liters of fresh water every day. It also generates a lot of garbage, five tons of it every 24 hours. There was a time long ago when ships would simply dump all that trash into the ocean. When I was at sea many years ago, on oil tankers, for example, I would, uh, on a ballast voyage, we would dig out oil from the crude tanks and just literally put, put it over the side into the sea and get a tot of rum at the end of the day. But those days are gone. Now it's Robert Scott's job to make sure no garbage on the QM2 gets chucked into the sea. We don't allow anything to go into the sea at all. A cigarette butt, for example, for flicked into the sea could take literally hundreds of years, 400 years to dissolve. Every day he has to dispose of the same amount of garbage as a city of 40,000. Well, we're really a little city. We get through a lot of waste, as we call it, garbage. It all comes down to the garbage room. On arrival, they separate it into glass, tin, one transatlantic trip alone produces one ton of crushed glass and 26,000 empty cans. Anything that can be burned is shredded, then incinerated at 1,000 degrees centigrade. The ash is collected and unloaded in port. Even waste water is treated. Black water from toilets and the ship's hospital are stored in buffer tanks. Bacteria is added to break down the waste. Then it's filtered through a membrane system. Only then is it discharged into the sea. 
And so it's all regulated. It's very tight now. Nobody can break the law um, without really meaning to break the law. Gray water from the sinks and showers is also treated, then stored as what's called technical water. It has two major uses. One of them is cleaning the decks. But the other could make the difference between life and death. Lots of smoke coming from uh, cabin 54. Call the assessment party and start to go down. Hey guys, make way. Fire is every sailor's worst nightmare. We got also fire alarm activated, cabin 54. Queen Mary 2 has never had a fire on board. Do you know if anyone is inside the cabin? You don't know, all right. OK, thank you very much, bye. Lots of smoke coming from uh, cabin 54. Call the assessment party and start to go down. Attention, assessment party. But if it happens, there can't be a moment's hesitation. That's why the crew practices the fire drill once a week. No matter what their position is, from the dishwashers to the senior officers, everyone has a job. And they're always working to perfect it. We have to go down to deck three and do boundary calling. So if you follow me, we'll make our way there now. We treat every drill as if it's a real situation. You have to, because we're talking about the guys in their BA suits, with the fire hose going into fight a fire, you know, that's, they're really, they're putting their, their lives in line. Hey guys, make way. Guys, when you check the cabins, make sure one man stands at the door, okay? One man to stay at the door, the other two to go in to check. They take their drills so seriously, they manufacture smoke to make it more realistic. During a real fire, Electric power and the ventilation system would be shut down in the affected area. The firefighters practice what's called a left-handed search, keeping their right hand on the fire hose and their left on the wall or the man in front to keep their bearings. If the fire is spreading too fast for the fire teams, the QM2's remarkable technology takes over. The ship is divided into nine fire zones. When smoke is detected in any one of them, that zone is evacuated. Fire doors are closed by remote control and the area is sealed. Air is sucked out by the ventilation system. Then, a superfine mist of water like a heavy fog is pumped through a network of special nozzles to smother the fire. Thank you very much, well done, good job, all right. The fire extinguishers are not the only automated system on board. The whole ship is automated. Up on the bridge, the first thing people notice is that there's no big steering wheel. The engine pods and bow thrusters that control the ship are all connected to a small joystick. But the truth is, for the most part, the ship sails itself. This entire crossing, uh, pretty much, we're going to be steering the ship with, with this autopilot. And uh, you know, people are always amazed that it's just by the control of this small dial that we can actually turn this, uh, this huge ship. I mean, the days of you know, seeing, the, seeing the captain kind of chained into one of these big wooden wheels with a, you know, lashed in in the bad weather is, uh, are gone. And I mean, and this, is, this is really the future. But that doesn't it's mean the officers the on the bridge can simply take the day off. Nine miles away. Nine miles. Yeah. Mariano, Hello. could you like please to check if we can see this target nine miles away on the starboard wing? Abim. The technology needs constant monitoring. You always need to compare all the different way, all the different equipments we have. We compare the GPS with the radar, the radar with the paper chart, the paper chart with the electronic chart. And of course, we also check with our eyes. See something, Mariano? Not yet, sir, no. Okay. But the ultimate failsafe is still the human eye. 
for sailors, I mean, you still look at, at windows. I mean, it's like when you used to have the, the guys up in the crow's nest on the, on the, on the old ships. Uh, and, that, and that's what we do. I mean, you can have as, as much technology as you want, but you still got to keep this visual look at because I still think like the, the human eye when it comes to things like this is, is your best tool. The officers will need every trained eye on the bridge and every piece of radar and navigation equipment for the next stage. Queen Mary II is nearing the end of the voyage, and that means she's about to enter the English Channel. This is where we really earn our money. So it's going to be busy, and it's going to get progressively busier from now until our arrival in the morning. Busy means being vigilant. All two points to starboard, two points to starboard, yeah. 500 commercial ships and hundreds of small boats travel the channel every day. There are two. Can you see both of them? Yeah. Yeah. Two. Of them. two. Okay. One of them crossing from right and left. One is crossing, yeah. Red hole. A few years ago, safety experts monitoring one section of the channel recorded 68 near misses during one 24-hour period. The QM2 wasn't one of them, but her officers must still be on constant alert. English Channel is the busiest area, pretty much the busiest area of shipping in the world. Um, and you get almost like a road of ships, ships in a line going exactly the same way. And um, just a case of who's going the fastest, ships overtaking each other, but uh, quite a build-up of traffic. And no doubt he's on there. He sat up on the bridge wishing he was on board here, <laughs> as they do. Okay, it's going to stay on. Hey, chip. Hard starboard. By nighttime, Queen Mary II is in the thick of the traffic in the English Channel and everyone on the bridge is watching like a hawk. It's here that the ship's electronic eyes and her amazing maneuverability pay off. And she'll need all of it working perfectly for the last challenge of the voyage, docking in Southampton. Queen Mary II has sailed from New York, thousands of miles across the Atlantic Ocean. Her encounter with high winds and bad weather didn't slow her down. But her last maneuver will be the most impressive of all, docking in Southampton in southern England. Speed 5.8, coming down slowly. She must execute a 180-degree turn and slip sideways alongside the pier. It requires a delicate touch. Speed is five and a half knots. We're still carrying the three degrees set to start. The captain uses the engine pods to slowly break the speed of the ship. That's two knots now. Then, he uses the bow thrusters to start pivoting it around. On the swing position, three in the bow starboard now. Roger, we're going to clear the buoy by eight zero meters, is that correct? Yeah, that's quite some. It's an astonishing feat, turning this giant around in a channel that's not much wider than the length of the ship. The next challenge is docking it in exactly the right spot. Okay, I'm on the wing. I have a very good view of the dock now on the port bow. We're in an excellent position. So I'm now going to start moving the ship ahead by coming ahead on the fixed pods. Just over 100 meters to come ahead. It's the ultimate parallel parking challenge. Nine zero meters to come ahead. Closing very slowly. Coming to a stop. 
So though you travelled 3,200 miles, it's down to the final inch to get her into position here. The end of one voyage signals the start of another. And as the ship settles into port, the frenzy and flurry of turnaround day is repeated. Ten hours to load passengers, provisions, and fuel, so Queen Mary II can turn around and do it all again. This time, it's a Spanish tile company that's chartered the ship for undisclosed millions as a thank you to their customers. Senor Pedro, how are you? Welcome all right. Queen Mary too. Thank you very much. Nice to have you. It's a pleasure. This is my old mayor staff. Wow. Mucho gusto. Nice to meet you. Yes. Mucho gusto. For the passengers, Queen Mary too has an air of effortless elegance. But down below, out of sight, for the crew, there's nothing effortless about it. It's like a a graceful white swan going through the water. To the outside, it's beautifully gliding through the water, but underneath, the uh, web feet are going like mad trying to keep up that speed. There's a lot of feverish activity going on behind the scenes, which the passengers don't see, to make sure we're maintaining the standard they all want and to arrive on schedule. Since her maiden voyage, Queen Mary II has crossed the Atlantic Ocean 60 times and logged more than 80,000 kilometers. In ship terms, she's still just a baby. She'll be expected to keep up this pace for another 37 years. And there's not one of her crew who doubts she can do it. She's the biggest, most sophisticated ocean liner ever to set sail. Queen Mary II. We are upon the greatest ocean liner in the world. She's as long as four football fields, as tall as a 21-story office tower, three times the size of the Titanic. It's like your front row seats to like the best free show on Earth. She's about to make the first transatlantic crossing of the season. The ship cannot be late in any way. She was built tough enough to weather the roughest seas, but the North Atlantic is notoriously unpredictable, and she'll need all her size and strength. Queen Mary II is a billion dollar floating hotel, but this is like no other hotel on earth. Dirk Brand is the ship's hotel manager. Good morning. How are you doing? Make it go nice and shiny. His hospitality spreads over 14 passenger decks, 1,300 staterooms, ranging from economy rooms with no view to luxury suites with private balconies, marble bathrooms, and a butler that go for $4,000 a night. Just waiting for the flowers to arrive okay. and the champagne. Fantastic. And then we are ready to go. Ready to go. His domain includes 10 restaurants, the world's largest floating ballroom, a disco, a casino, several bars, a spa, five swimming pools, 
the biggest library at sea, stocked with 8,000 books, a huge Broadway-style theater, and the world's only floating planetarium. The QM2 is so big, when she ties up in New York Harbor, She's the biggest, most sophisticated ocean liner ever to set sail. Queen Mary II. We are upon the greatest ocean liner in the world. She's as long as four football fields, as tall as a 21-story office tower, three times the size of the Titanic. It's like your front row seats to like the best free show on Earth. She's about to make the first transatlantic crossing of the season. The ship cannot be late in any way. She was built tough enough to weather the roughest seas, but the North Atlantic is notoriously unpredictable, and she'll need all her size and strength. Queen Mary II is a billion dollar floating hotel, but this is like no other hotel on earth. Dirk Brand is the ship's hotel manager. Good morning. How are you doing? Make it all nice and shiny. His hospitality spreads over 14 passenger decks, 1,300 staterooms, ranging from economy rooms with no view to luxury suites with private balconies, marble bathrooms, and a butler that go for $4,000 a night. Just waiting for the flowers to arrive okay. and the champagne. Fantastic. And then we are ready to go. Ready to go. His domain includes 10 restaurants, the world's largest floating ballroom, a disco, a casino, several bars, a spa, five swimming pools, the biggest library at sea, stocked with 8,000 books, a huge Broadway-style theater, and the world's only floating planetarium.